السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته جزاك الله خير إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم وبعد يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد Always and forever we begin with the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send our prayers of peace upon the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam We testify with firmness and conviction that there is none that is worthy of worship but Allah That Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his worshipping slave and final messenger We continually remind one another of our duty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our consciousness and awareness of Him in the capacity that He is deserving of. And we seek and we pray that we do not depart from this worldly life in any condition other than willful, voluntary submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My dear brothers and sisters, once again, I greet you with the tahiyya, the greeting of the people of Jannah. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it from me as a dua for you and from you for me. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah. Always we have the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in mind and in aim. Whenever we gather to discuss the words of Allah and the sunnah of his Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we begin by mentioning that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam speaks of such occasions as we are gathered today by saying, حَفَّتْهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ that the angels encircle bi'idhnillah gathering such as ours. And they come and the word that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu uses, حَفَّتْهُمْ it means envelops them. And the word حَفَّتْ it means an intimate embrace. It's that they become so close to you and so much near to you in a physical tangible sense that they become the warmth in your cold and the protection from your enemy and the harm that is to befall you they are what is a barrier between you and it this is the meaning of hafatum and the word is used in arabi you know in, in egypt we say give me ilhaf give me something it's freezing cold give me something to cover myself with this is the kind of meaning that the Prophet ﷺ exchanges with this word. So we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us from those who are fortunate that the angels intertwine themselves in our life. And that they become from those who are our guardians in this dunya and in the akhirah as is promised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an. We, our first session will continue until the adhan of dhuhr bi'idhnillah ta'ala which is about an hour from now. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, my dear brothers and sisters. We have a very ambition, ambitious mission ahead of us, right? Uh, when we read and look at the words of Imam al-Nawawi, I tried to be selective. I said to myself, look, you know, we want to get as much uh, formal knowledge from the writing of an imam as we can. So I said, I'm going to be choosy what I'm going to narrate and what I'm going to translate. And this is what happened. <laughs> Everything. There's nothing that you can leave. His words, mashallah, I actually ran out of yellow. So a little bit further down, I just had to start using my pen and pencil. Because everything you want to highlight, what he says, is something profound. And I pray, inshallah, that the time that we spend together, uh, thinking of the words, that encourage us to study our faith, its elements, its basis. You know, the building blocks of the sunnah. The building, when we say the building blocks of the sunnah, we're talking about the hadith and the, the verses in the Quran that give us 
what the modality of life, what was the habit of life of our Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, remains with us and what it was in his time Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now many of you would have received this document, it's about 20, 27, 28 pages long I believe. Yes, 28 pages long. And basically, we're not going to be able to look at much of it. I do want to read to you some of the poetry of Imam al-Shafi'i. And there's a, a quite a, you know, I thought, how could you talk about a Shafi'i and not include his poetry? Something from his diwan and, and some of his statements in it. So on page 17 onwards, there's quite a bit of poetry that's in Arabic and English translated for you that you can become acquainted with, you know, his philosophy, his altruism, his views on life. You know, the first poem talks about his rizq. Who is in control of his rizq? And he says, Tawakkaltu fi rizqi ala Allahi khaliqi. I give myself up completely to Allah, my creator, to be the one who will provide for me. I have no fear that anyone can intervene between me and my rizq. You know, these elemental statements that he makes, we will try to look at a few of his poems, insha'Allah, uh, and study them as we proceed. But our main aim is to look at this wonderful book. Now, for those of you who are near, you could see it's the first of a volume. This particular print, it's a first edition print, and it is in 23 books. So this is the first of 23 other books, right? That Al-Imam al-Shaf, Al-Imam al-Nawawi, and those who completed his work put together. Uh, when you look into the life of Al-Imam al-Nawawi, which I've uh, extracted a short biography there for you, that you can read on your own. There's an extensive biography of Al-Imam al-Shafi'i and an extensive biography of Al-Imam al-Nawawi. I want you to become familiar with these names because I want you to ask this question. Ask yourself this question. Who was the governor and the Khalifa and the Wali and the Sultan who was alive and ruling at the time of an Imam Nawawi? Anyone know their name? No one knows their name. You have to research it to find out who's the Khalifa. He was the Khalifa, the man who governed Nawawi, the man who built hospitals and palaces and fought the Mongols, but no one knows his name. Why do you know an Imam al Nawawi's name? Because he's an Imam al Nawawi. That's the short answer. Allah accepted from him what he didn't accept from others. And one of the first things that I want to set for us today is that it's not about how much you know, but it's about how much Allah accepts from you subhanahu wa ta'ala. There were people who were definitely more articulate, more knowledgeable than people like Imam al-Nawawi. There were people who wrote books whose books are lost. No one remembers their books anymore. More voluminous in their explanations. But there are certain personalities and individuals whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted from them what he did not accept from other than them. And you will see this as a part of our life today. You, you might all of a sudden see yourself highly educated, mashallah. You went to the best universities here and abroad. And you think to yourself, why am I struggling to find a good job? And you look to someone who you think is less. Hasn't studied in the most prestigious place. May not have the same amount of years of experience. But Allah gave them what he did not give to you. And therefore Allah says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَنُفَضِّلُ بَعْضَكُمْ عَلَىٰ بَعْضٍ فِي الرِّزْقِ We give to some more than others in rizq. We accept from some others more than others. We give others more. So it is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Al-Imam al-Nawawi is a foundation of our faith. He is like a building block that our deen, the deen you practice today, is established, carried on his shoulder. Because he stood on the shoulders of others to bring to us this Islam that we are familiar with today, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. When we begin reading his words and translating them for you, now, for those of you who have studied with me before, you know I usually quote the statement of um, the great Imam Ibn Sirin, where he says that the student who comes to lesson without a pen or a pencil, 
is like a soldier who comes to battle without a, without a weapon, without a sword, right? You don't want to be caught in battle without a sword. Don't be caught in a lesson without a pen and paper, insha'Allah. So I will leave the, we will turn to moments in the life of Imam al-Shafi'i and moments to the life of Imam al-Nawawi as we begin the sharh of this statement. How will the class proceed for these next few hours, insha'Allah? The scholars of Islam, they've always had the habit of differentiating between two things, which is metn, a text, and sharh, explanation of the text. And in fact, this book, these 23 volumes, is an explanation of a four-volume book written by Imam al-Shirazi, right? So Imam al-Nawawi took that basic text and then explained it into 23 volumes, right? Our aim today, inshallah, is to follow that sunnah of the great imams, that we will read the text and we will give little moments of insight that we can parallel into our civilized, western, leaning, high technology, Facebook, Twitter, hashtag lifestyle, <laughs> all right? So we will look at it and see how we can apply it into our contemporary lifestyle, insha'Allah. As with all books that study fiqh and hadith and build our faith, the first chapter is always the chapter of sincerity, ikhlas. And when you look into al-Imam al-Nawawi's works, he wrote a book called The Forty Hadith. All of us are familiar with The Forty Hadith of Imam al-Nawawi. And the first hadith in it is about sincerity. And he followed in that the sunnah of the great imams, like Imam al-Bukhari and Imam Muslim and others, who made the very first hadith, that particular hadith. So we're going to begin with the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al-Nawawi writes, and we're on page 36. وَفِي الْإِخْلَاصِ وَالصِّدْقِ وَإِحْضَارُ النِّيَّةِ فِي جَمِيعِ الْأَعْمَالِ الْبَارِزَةِ وَالْخَفِيَّةِ This text is not written in front of you. So I'm going to give you the explanation. <laughs> Al-Imam al-Nawawi says, in terms of sincerity and ikhlas and truthfulness. Now this word, he uses the word sincerity and truthfulness as being the same. Sidq and ikhlas are the same. And in fact, you can add a third word to that, which is nasiha, advice. The Arab, they use the word nasiha to mean sincere. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu in surat al-tahreem, O you who believe, tubu ila Allahi tawbatan nasuha. Nasiha. What advice? It's not advice, it's sincerity. The Arab, when they said someone was going to give me advice, their assumption was that it had to be sincere. Why would someone give me advice if they were not sincere? Now we have to pause here for a second. Look at how culture has changed. At the time before Muhammad wasallam, those illiterate, uncultured Arab who committed, you know, atrocities and buried their young daughters and worshipped Hubal and all these grievous things that we know, they could not fathom, they could not even imagine that someone would sit you down and say, I have advice for you, and they wouldn't be truthful to you. It was an impossibility that someone would lie to you or that someone would be hypocritical. In fact, all of the Imams say that the, the concept of nifaq was not in existence in Mecca. It only began after the hijrah to al Madinah of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Before that, people like Abu Sufyan, who was not yet Muslim, when he stood in front of Hiraql, Heraclius in Damascus, in Syria, and he began to ask him about this Nabi Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to him, what family is he from? Was he known to lie before? Was his father or ancestors kings? You know, all these questions. And Abu Sufyan says, 
I felt I could not lie because behind me, near me, were people min ashirati from my family that I thought to myself, if they hear me lie, I will lose all respect. Even though he hated Muhammad Sallallahu this is his opportunity to speak to this emperor and say, send us troops and kill Muhammad Sallallahu He said, I couldn't bring myself to lie about him. I had to speak the truth. Not out of faith, but out of ethics. Three words, ikhlas, truthfulness, and advice, all mean the same thing in the Arabic language. And he says, فِي جَمِيعِ الْأَعْمَالِ الْبَارِزَةِ وَالْخَفِيَّةِ Imam al-Nawwi was very precise in his words. He says, these moments of truthfulness and sincerity and this ethic that you have is a part of your life in your open public life and even more so in your hidden private life. He continues, why? قَالَ تَعَالَى Allah the Most High says, وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ They were only ordered, the only meaning, the main command, the basis of all faith, everything that relates to our deen, our way of life, our way of returning to Allah to gain Jannah, is that we single out Allah hoping with sincerity that we give nothing to other than Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, وَقَالَ تَعَالَى And Allah says, فَاعْبُدِ اللَّهَ مُخْلِصًا لَهُ الدِّينَ Ya Muhammad, Allah begins with Muhammad Sallallahu in Surah Az-Zumar. Worship Allah, singling only him out with complete sincerity. Don't give anything of it away to other. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, وَمَنْ يَخْرُجْ مِنْ بَيْتِهِ مُهَاجِرًا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ this ayah that was in Surah An-Nisa, a man who was old in age, and the hadith is in the Sahih in Bukhari and Muslim. Everyone had made hijrah, even the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had made hijrah. And there was a man who lived in Mecca, yaktumu imanahu. He has hidden his faith from the mushrikeen. He was fearful that they would kill him or harm him or put hardship upon him. And because of his old age, he said to himself, even my children don't believe, no one around me believes, I must escape Mecca silently. So he would secretly get his camel ready for this arduous long journey from Mecca to Medina that would take more than a week by desert. And in the middle of the night, he slips out of his home, slips out of Mecca, and he begins this travel to the Medina in Hijrah to Allah, and his Nabi Muhammad Halfway there or a little more, now notice in this hadith, we don't even know this man's name. Allah have mercy on him. Halfway there, due to his old age and the difficulty of the journey, he felt his death is imminent. So he put one hand in the other. And he shook his own hand and he said, Allahumma hadihi bay'ati. Oh Allah, this is my pledge of allegiance to you and your Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the middle of the desert and he died. And Allah informs the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with this verse in the Quran. وَمَنْ يُحَاجِرْ إِلَى اللَّهِ The one who went out in hijrah to Allah and his messenger. No one knows anything about him. No one even knows his name. No Sahaba were waiting for him. No one even knew he was Muslim. He was just went missing. But Allah knows him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thumma yudrikhu al-mawt. And Allah chronicles what happened to him. The one who goes out in hijrah to Allah and his messenger. And in his journey, his death comes to him. فَقَدْ وَقَعَ أَمْرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ His matter is only for Allah to reward him for it. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ikhlas. Ikhlas and sincerity to Allah the Most High. And then Al Imam al Nawawi narrates to us the hadith of Umar ibn al Khattab, anhu, the one we all know, where he says, Samiatu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul, innama al a'malu bin niyat. Now, one of the wonderful things about this hadith is that Umar is the only one who reports it from the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But from Umar, thousands report it, right? It was off mentioned. 
قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول إنما الأعمال بالنيات Surely all actions are relative to the pre-intention of their commission. Before you do something, what you intend is what sets the basis of the reward or the punishment or whatever it may be you will receive upon the commission of that deed. Al-Imam al-Nawawi says, Hadith Sahih muttafaqun ala sihhati. This hadith is agreed upon by both Bukhari and Muslim. And he says, Everyone in our faith has accepted it as being a foundation. Now after Imam al-Nawawi mentions the words of Allah, then he mentioned the words of who? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who do you think is going to be the third words that he will mention? The person who he felt he could receive and has learned the deen from, even though he didn't live in his era, but the one who he felt deserved clarity and showed clarity of understanding, he says, Qala Shafi'i. As Shafi'i said. What did As Shafi'i say? Rahimahullah. Yadkhulu hadha al hadith fi sab'ina baban min al fiqh. This hadith of Umar enters into 70 chapters of fiqh. You can put it in the chapters that relate to marriage. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Brother, don't get married and have, you know, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Sisters, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ In being a father, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ In being a teacher, in being an employer, in being an employee, in every part of your fiqh of life, this hadith is relevant. Actions are judged by their intentions. وَقَالَ أَيْضًا الشَّافِعِي also said هُوَ ثُلُثَ الْعِلْمِ This hadith, actions are judged by intention, is a third of all knowledge. If you learn three things about Islam, this is the first that you're going to learn. وَكَذَلِكَ قَالَ أَيْضًا غَيْرُهُ And many other than الشَّافِعِي said it. وَهُوَ أَحَدِ الْأَحَدِيثَ الَّتِي عَلَيْهَا مَضَارُ الْإِسْلَامِ And this hadith, Islam circles around it. Everything that is submission to Allah is touched by it. And there has been dispute in its application, whether it's a third of our faith or a quarter of our faith or half of our faith. But everything that relates to our deen is touched upon by this hadith. He then says, وَقَدْ جَمَعْتُ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ وَهَذِهِ الْأَحَدِيثِ مِثْلَهَا كلها في جزء الأربعين. And I gathered this hadith, which is the first hadith in his Arba'een, and other hadith that relate to similar matter into my 40 hadith book. Now here Imam al-Nawawi is pointing you to something important. Here he's talking about fiqh, and he's beginning a 23 volume book, but he tells you where the basis of all this fiqh comes from. He says, فَبَلَغَتْ أَرْبَعِينَ حَدِيثًا I gathered hadith and it's more than 40 hadith لَا يَسْتَغْنِي عَنْهَا متدين. No one religious cannot know them. Look at his words. These 40 hadith of Imam al-Nawawi. لِأَنَّهَا كُلَّهَا صَحِيحَةً جَامِعَةً قَوَاعِدَ الْإِسْلَامِ Because those 40 hadith are authentic and gather the base of all of our faith. في الأصول والفروع والزهد والأدب ومكارم الأخلاق. These hadith that I've gathered, they relate to the pillars and the foundation of our faith, and the subsidiary branches of our laws of governance, and zuhd, abstinence from the worldly life and seeking the akhirah, and al-adab, etiquette and ethics and manners, ومكارم الأخلاق and refinement of conduct and character. We continue with the words of Imam al-Nawawi. He says, وَرَوَيْنَا And we also report from the great Imam Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi. لَوْ صَنَّفْتُ كِتَابًا لَبَدَأْتُ فِي أَوَّلِ كُلِّ بَابٍ بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ One of the great Imams of Hadith, he said, if I was to write another book, every chapter I would begin it with this Hadith. That's how important it is. So let's understand why this hadith is so important. Al-Imam al-Nawawi continues by saying, 
Al-a'mal bin-niyat Actions are judged by their intentions. It means Amama kulli shay. It is the imam of everything. Your niyyah is the one who leads you. You know how you're in lead in prayer? He gives you this allegory and this illusion that the actions you're going to do, it's before everything that you do. You have to contemplate what you're going to do before you do it. And one of the things that we struggle with as Muslims, quite often in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that we have this reflex action of worship. All of a sudden it's Ramadan. Well, what are we going to do? Well, we fast. But we understand that there's levels to fasting. There's the fasting of the heart. There's the fasting of the stomach. There's the fasting of the eyes. There's the fasting of the hands. There's the fasting of the ears. There's the fasting of the spirit. And every part of it has that intention in drawing closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He also says that the great Imam and Sahabi of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Abdullah ibn Abbas explains this hadith by saying, إِنَّمَا يُعْطَى الرَّجُلْ عَلَىٰ قَدْرِ نِيَّتِهِ Allah will give you only in accordance to your niyyah. So if you were to stand up all night in prayer and your heart was not present except in a part of it, the standing was just tiredness. As the Prophet ﷺ describes fasting, the one who fasts but has a vulgar mouth and is not careful with his conduct. At the end of the day, the only thing he received, the Prophet ﷺ says, al wal atash. His reward is hunger and thirst. That person's reward is standing up at night. That's it. He got nothing from it. He continues by saying, Don't ever do anything for the pleasure of others when it is an act of worship. And don't leave anything of worship on account of others. And don't give anyone anything that should only be for Allah, for others. وَلَا تَكْشُفْ لَهُمْ شَيْئًا And don't expose yourself or others to them for any reason than for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are words that consol can consolidate this concept. Don't do anything except for Allah. Don't leave anything except for Allah. Don't give anything except for Allah. Don't abstain from anything except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He continues with another narration from Sufyan al-Thawri where he says, مَا عَلَشْتُ شَيْئًا أَشَدُّ عَلَيَّ مِن نِيَّتِي فَإِنَّهَا تَتَقَلَّبُ عَلَيَّ This great Imam Sufyan al-Thawri, a person who lived with the Sahaba, and he is one of the seven foundation of the Tabi'een. He is one of the great Ubad, worshippers of Allah. He says, I never had to cure myself of anything more difficult than making my intention only for Allah. For even when I'm doing something and I've said it for Allah, as I'm about to do it, it changes. Sometimes you, 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 you're coming to the masjid and you say, inshallah, today I'm going to put a hundred ringgit in charity. And as you're about to do it, someone sees how much you're putting and they smile. And your niya changed. All of a sudden you felt good. Alhamdulillah, it's good. But you're doing, you, you didn't intend that person to smile or to have any, any goodness in it. This is what Sufyan al Thawri is talking about. At that moment, you have to cure it. You have to call back yourself. You have to set another niya from that niya. The initial niyyah was good, but now you need a new niyyah to establish that relationship and that reward in its entirety with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us define al-ikhlas. This is something important for us. And Imam al-Nawawi continues by saying, Al-ikhlas ifradu al-haqqi fi ta'ati bil qasd Ikhlas, it is to seek out truth through obedience 
with intention to seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through an act of truth and an act of worship, through an act of worship, بِقَصْدْ intending Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَهُوَ أَنْ يُرِيدُ بِالطَّاعَةِ أَتَّقَرُّبِ إِلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى And the moment you act on your intention, you do it seeking to be closer to Allah. Now this is foundation stuff. This is important. It's not, oh Allah, this is for you, but it's, oh Allah, I want to draw closer to you because of it. دُونَ شَيْءٍ آخر. And to be distant from other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. مِن تَصَنُّعٍ لمخلوق. In particular, that anyone who is created will benefit with what you are giving to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or that which you have intended for Allah the Most High. فَالْمُخْلِصْ لَا رِيَاءَ لَهُ The one who is sincere never seeks to be seen. I want to narrate to you a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu In the authentic hadith narrated by Imam Ahmad, he says, أَحَبُّ الْخَلْقِ إِلَى اللَّهِ those whom Allah loves the most from His creation. Who's the one Allah loves the most? al ghani someone who's wealthy. Whoa, okay. at wealthy but pious. al khafi who's hidden from the sight of others. Look at these three words. Ghani, taqi, khafi. Wealthy, Pious, but hidden. Those qualities are very rare. Most people who are wealthy are celebrities, famous. Everyone knows them. It's not about being known in a sphere of life. It's about being known in status. Prophet ﷺ says, the ones whom Allah favors are those who are known, but their relationship with Allah is hidden from others. They're not people who anyone could estimate that these are the people who are nearest to Allah the Most High and therefore they are loved by Allah. The wealthy, the pious, who are hidden. No one estimates that they are that close and that near in their connection to Allah. Uh, a former ambassador to Australia, he's no longer the ambassador so I can talk about him. Uh, Egyptian ambassador from, five, from seven years ago, eight years ago. I was visiting Canberra, uh, which is where all the embassies and everything is, and I found out that the person who opened the masjid, every Fajr, was that ambassador. He's the one who would come and open the masjid and clean it and wash the bathrooms and the toilets before people came for Fajr prayer. Allahu Akbar. No one knew. How did people find out? Only few people knew who was the person who would come, just his close friend, he said, don't tell anyone. How did people find out when he no longer was the ambassador? <laughs> All of a sudden he's in a different country. People are like, what happened to the masjid? <laughs> Why is the toilets looking like this? What, no one's vacuumed the carpet. How come we came, the doors are still locked? Where, where, who opens the masjid? Who's in charge? Oh, Wallahi, it was that brother, he's gone. Allahu Akbar. No one knew. Al Ghani, Al Taqi, Al Khafi, hidden. Al Imam the Noon, he says, Al Imam al Nawawi quotes, Thalath, three things, Min alamat al Ikhlas, that are sign of you being sincere. Let's study how do we know we're sincere. استواء المدح والذم من العامة that you don't pay attention or regard highly people's praise or dispraise of you if they're from the general people people who just see you in the street you know people who don't know you you don't take offense if they say something that you bad about you and you're not happy when they say something good about you because they don't really know you it's not like your wife. Your wife, she says something good, you should be happy. She says something bad, you should be worried. 
because she's not amma, she's not general public. She knows you intimately. She's a part of your life. So he says, when people who don't, are not acquainted with you, uh, you're not, you don't know me. Yeah, inshallah, you know me. But you don't know me. You don't live with me. You don't do business with me. You don't share things with me. You hear my words and you might watch a video, alhamdulillah. So when you say, mashallah, brother Yahya, it's like, yeah, that's good. But you don't know me. You have to ask my wife. Don't ask my wife. <laughs> She's the one who will tell you. Does he pray at night? Does he read Quran? Does he teach his children? Is he good with his money? Does, is he cheap or does he spend? You know, all these things that are known within people is what matters. So what you say about me, inshallah matters, but doesn't matter. Between me and Allah, doesn't matter. So that's the first sign. That you don't wait for people who don't know you intimately to praise you. And if people dispraise you because they don't know you, it doesn't bother you. Yes. Number two. Nisyan ru'yat al fil a'mal. You forget about the action in the action. What does that mean? You know how some people when they're standing in salah, every concern in their mind is, is my hand in the right place? Did I say this the right way? They become very compulsive about the routine. He says, when you perform ikhlas, it's no longer the routine, but it is the outcome that is generated from your salah, from your fasting, from your sadaqah. You forget about the deed because of the deed. Now, that's a wonderful statement. Waqtida number three, amali fil That everything you practice has an outcome for you in the akhirah. Everything you do, there is something you will gain because of it in the next life. There is something that is an outcome for you in the akhirah. Even if it is to go to work, even if it is to have comfort with your wife, even it is how, how you speak to your children, the aim behind it is, I want reward from the Akhirah. And the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ taught this to the Sahaba very well. In the hadith narrated by the Imam Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, when a husband finds comfort intimately with his wife, they are given sadaqah, it's a, a, a reward between them and Allah. And the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, that a person finds comfort with his spouse, it is rewarded, and the Prophet ﷺ said, if he found comfort outside his home, wouldn't it be a sin? They said, yes. He said, well, if it is a rewarded action, if it's a sin in the haram, then it is a sadaqah in the halal. Everything in your life, your ikhlas can intend and make you receive a reward in the akhirah. Driving to work and being patient in KL traffic, huge reward. Right? MashaAllah. Huge. The intention. It's not just acts of worship. Any action you perform. Cooking a meal, washing a garment, doing anything that is routine in your life, you can earn a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. Al-Imam Al-Nawawi continues where he quotes Al-Imam Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad. Al-Imam Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad. He said, Tarku al-amal li-ajl al-nas riyaa. To not do an act of worship because you think people are going to hold you in esteem from it is riyaa. Uh, I was... Uh, I was sitting with the Imam of the Prophet's Masjid Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We were in India together. And I always thought, you know, SubhanAllah, how can you, to me, how can someone stand in the same spot where the member of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was? You stand on the pulpit 
of where the Prophet ﷺ stood, that you are within earshot, like the Prophet ﷺ is buried within your sight. You can see him from there, his, his qabr sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there are thousands and hundreds of thousands of people listening to your words about Allah. And I said to a shaykh, Salah al Bidir, I said, Ya shaykh, how do you prepare your sincerity that you stand where the Prophet ﷺ stood and you give people your talk? I don't, know, I don't know how anyone can do it. And the Shaykh put his head down and he began to weep. Allah yahfadu. And he said these same words. I didn't know they were the words of an Imam Fudail. I didn't know them. But he said this exact same sentence. He said, to leave something, because you think people will say, oh, look who does he, look how mashaAllah, he must have great intention and ikhlas to stand in the masjid of the Prophet, to lead the prayers in front of the Kaaba. To, wow, he must be a muttaqi. You know how some people, we as, as human beings, we get uh, very weird. People try to grab things. And I was with uh, Sheikh Mishari Al Afasi just three weeks ago. We were in, La in Birmingham. Allahu Akbar. People trying to rip his clothes off, man. <laughs> trying to get into the car to get to the hotel. People are like, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, you got to push him back. Why? He's just a man, right? Why? Ikhlas. It's, it's not about who the person is or what they do. It's about what Allah gives them, subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? What their intention is and what they will receive on the day of judgment. So don't be confined to people from the outer, right? Here the Imam says, and all of the Imams will tell you, I cannot leave it because you think I'm better. You might be better than me. Your salah may be more accepted than me. Think of it this way. I explain this to my younger students. I say, if I have $10,000 in the bank, and you have $100 in the bank, and all of a sudden they ask for charity, and you give $100 in charity, and I give $1,000 in charity, who will receive a greater ajr? Who has done more? Your $100, your $10. Even if it's your $10 out of 100, and I give 1,000, your ajr is much more because that money for you as a young man who isn't working, who you've been saving, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not about quantity. It's not about what you do, but it's about the niyyah. Innama al-a'malu bin niyyah. The ikhlas to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says, to leave something because you think people will say, oh, look at this man and how great he is and mashaAllah, is riya. You've actually reinforced that you were doing it for them. So continue doing what you do. Sheikh Salih. Hafizahullah, the Imam of the Prophet's Masjid, he said to me, we must continue do what we do even if we know we're not fit for it. Because you have to perceive and hope Allah will forgive you the shortcomings you have in your life. To do something knowing that people, that you've done it for the eyes of people or for the pleasure of people is you have joined someone in your worship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a minor level of shirk. Well, ikhlas, sincerity, is that Allah protects you from those two things. That you don't leave something because people will think something about you, and you don't do something because you expect people to say something for you. Both of them, when you separate those two, in the middle is ikhlas, sincerity. You didn't leave anything because you don't think people are going to talk about it, and you didn't do anything because you think people should praise you for it. You've kept it only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Finally, the words of Yusuf ibn Hussein radiallahu anhu wa rahimah, أَعَزُّ شَيْءٍ عِنْدَ الْمُؤْمِنِ فِي الدُّنْيَا الْإِخْلَاصِ Nothing is more significant to a believer in his whole life than to be sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing in your life should have any precedent or aim for you greater than for you to be sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the word ikhlas. Then he turns his attention to the word sidq, 
truthfulness. وَأَمَّا الصِّدْقُ فَقَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَكُونُوا مَعَ الصَّادِقِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an in Surah At-Tawbah 119 or 118 O you who believe, ittaqullah, be mindful of Allah, wakunu, and keep close to, and be bound to, those who are truthful in word and conduct. As-sidq imadul amr. Truthfulness is what holds everything together. Wabihi tamamu, and it's what completes everything. If all of your deeds are perfect, but you're missing that word, that truthfulness in word and action, you've missed and lost everything in life. What is Sidq? Istiwa usirri wal alaniya. That what you do in your private life is the same as your pu- public life. Sidq, truthfulness in your relationship with Allah, is that which what you do in public is the same as that which you do in private. And I do not need to embarrass myself or any of my brothers and sisters here about how far away we are from Sidq. That for many of us, the greatest challenge in life is to find something in our hidden personal life that can equal what people think of us in our public life. For many, our public life seems, mashallah, we attend courses, we teach courses, we read Quran, we go to the jami', we go to halaqa, we have, uh, you know, invite people over. But the inner life, the private life, where you are alone between you and Allah, when everyone is asleep and you've joined them, when your ibadah that is between you and Allah is much less than your ibadah between you and Allah and others. If you think about the actions of worship that we do, how many of them exclude others from that presence? How often are we in the worship of Allah when no one else knows about it? This is called sir, between you and Allah. No one knows. And that is Sidq. And therefore, the Imams would say, As-Sidq Sayfullah. That action of truthfulness is the sword of Allah. That Allah cuts people in halves with. That separates people with. Qata Allahu bihi nas Allah will separate people on the day of judgment with that sword of truth. How much, okay, all those who used to worship me in public come to this side. How many of you also worship me in private? The few of you come to this side. What is the first words given to our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after the wahi of iqra' bismi rabbik? The next words he receives is, Ya ayyuhal, ha. There's Muzammil and? And what, the, what does it say? Qum fa'andir. One of them is stand up and warn. And the other surah which talks about the same incident using a different word. Both of them is, O oh, one who is cloaked. One of them is Qum fa'andir. Tell people about what you've seen and heard. And the other is Qum layla illa qalila. Stand up all night except few hours. Why night? Because no one sees him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Don't do it, don't stand in front of the Kaaba in broad daylight so everyone say, oh, he's praying again. No, between you and Allah, build a relationship. Qurba, a nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Imam al-Nawawi continues by saying, الصدق يدور مع الحق حيث دار. Truthfulness will lead you 
to following the truth irrespective of where it leads you. فَإِذَا كَانَ الْفَضْلِ If it is something that leads you towards something that you want in life, you will follow it. And if your truthfulness is going to lead you from something you're worried about, you will still follow it. Most people, it's easy for them to go to something that they already want. If you say to someone, hey, let's go to Umrah, okay, everyone wants to go to Umrah. If you say to someone, instead of going to Umrah, okay, how much is that money for that ticket and that stay? How about you give it to this cause? And these people, you've been to Umrah before? Yes. Have you got, Alhamdulillah, you've been to, Alhamdulillah. Okay, how about you give it in this cause? Sometimes your heart is not intent on that. But the truth leads you to giving and doing to what is best, not just for yourself, but for others. And therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ali Imran, لَن تَنَالُ الْبِرْ You will never attain righteousness until you can give from that which you love the most. You can give to someone from that which you love the most. Because the truthfulness, it's for Allah. It's not just something that I have to like for it to be something that is worthy for others. He continues by saying, Truthfulness may lead you to fulfilling salah and sitting with the scholars with salihin but it might also imply المسلم, helping other believers مكسور, and bringing pleasure and happiness to someone who, who was broken hearted all of this is something that will praiseworthy that it's easy for you to want to do it but sometimes the truth may lead you to something that is difficult for you to attain that doesn't have that public spectral, specter uh, to it that is still important for you to perform. And therefore he then reports about our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. كانت للرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم أحوال في صلاته وصيامه وأوراده our Prophet ﷺ had different levels in his prayer, in his siyam, in his readings of the Qur'an and dhikr, in his eating, in his drink, in his attire, in his mode of transport, in his enjoyment of time with his, with his family and company, in his humor. All of these different things, he would still have time for it as a part of him still establishing his sincerity to Allah. So Imam al-Nawawi ends this discussion with, sin- with truthfulness and sincerity by saying, to be sincere and truthful to Allah doesn't mean you have to be stern, and doesn't mean you have to be serious, and doesn't mean you cannot have joy, and doesn't mean that you cannot be engaged in something that is fun and entertaining. And just like the Prophet had time for prayer and fasting, and, and Hajj and Jihad, he also had time for his family and for joke and for merriment and for enjoyment Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim He had time for laughter and anger and he was from those who had time to enjoin good and to forbid evil meaning being part of those who are truthful to Allah is that there is this balanced approach to life and one of the talks that I will have later on, insha'Allah, this week or next week? Balance. This week, insha'Allah. 7th of October, insha'Allah, is finding balance in an imbalanced world. The world is out of balance. How do we find that balance as our Prophet wasallam found? You know, it's an important element of our truthfulness in our relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're going to begin the next chapter. We're on page 40 of Imam al-Nawawi's works, where now he's, he's spoken about two elements, al-ikhlas wa sidq. And now this leads us into the virtue of ilm, of knowledge. 
And many of the statements that are exchanged by Imam al-Nawawi are found in the booklet that you have in front of you on page number 22 onwards. So I've made sure to include the verses of the Qur'an and the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Imam al-Nawawi used in this area. So that way you don't have to write it down and you can listen to the explanation of the hadith insha'Allah. Once again, he shows us his approach to knowledge, which is the words of Allah, then the sunnah and the statements of the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu and then the statements of the Sahaba and the great Imam al-Shafi'i and others from the madhab. He begins by saying that there are a multitude of verses in the Qur'an that speak about the virtue of knowledge. When we talk about knowledge, we're talking about the sacred knowledge. The knowledge of what Allah wants from us to know and what he revealed to his Nabi Muhammad sallallahu that he could not keep from us. Knowledge that betters us as human beings and makes us examples for others in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Allah said in the Quran, قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِي الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Say to them, can those who know and those who do not know be made equal? Can they be made on equal footing? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu is to invoke him and to ask him for an increase in ilm. And Allah says, وَقُلْ And I command you, O Muhammad, to continually and consistently ask me for more knowledge. The only place in the Qur'an where the Prophet ﷺ is ordered to ask for something and increase in it is for ilm. It's not, oh Allah, give me more iman. Or, oh Allah, give me more health or more wealth or more victory. No. The only thing, وَقُلْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي عِلْمًا And Allah says, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ Surely those who have the greatest awe and fear of Allah from amongst his servants are those who have attained scholarship, ulama. And we're going to qualify these words because ulama is not a title of research. How many people know the Qur'an but are ignorant of it? And how many people have memorized the hadith but are unaware of its reality? And how many people have memorized chapters and books of fiqh, but are unacquainted with their meaning and their application for the betterment of their life and the life of others. So who are the ulama will be defined for us shortly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ درجات. Allah will raise in rank those who believe from amongst you and above them, those who have attained knowledge levels upon levels. And therefore Allah tells us in the Qur'an that knowledge attained by one is not limited except that there will be someone more knowledgeable than them. وَفَوْقَ كُلِّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ Everyone more knowledgeable, there is one who has greater knowledge endowed than they have been given. Then Imam Nawawi quotes the hadith of Muawiyah radiallahu anhu wa ardah, the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, where the Prophet sallallahu said, مَن يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ The one whom Allah wishes for him goodness, he gives him or her a firm understanding of the religion. Uh, we're going to end with this important uh, explanation, inshaAllah, disclaimer. There is a difference between ilm and fahm. Write this down inshaAllah. There is a difference between ilm, knowledge, and fahm, understanding. Fahm and ilm mean two separate things, although people use it in the same way. Ilm does not necessarily give you fahm. Knowledge does not necessarily mean that one will attain understanding of that knowledge. And how many people are those who have learned or memorized something, but they don't understand it? 
Uh, and don't think that this is limited to people who are a'ajim, meaning who don't know Arabi or, or, or something. So I, I wish to make a small, uh, to, to impact this point. How many of us have memorized Surah Wal Adiyati Dabha? Maybe for years in our life. Wal Adiyati Dabha, Fal Muriyati Qadha, Fal Mughirati Subha. How many know, Inna Atainaka Al Kawthar? How many know What does that mean? Who can, who, you know, what does غاسقن, either, you can even ask an Arabic person. You go to an Egyptian guy, Saudi guy, and say, hey, what does wal'adiyati dabha mean? He'll say, wallahi ma'arafsha, yani, I, I I'm not sure. Something, yani, it's important. Tayyib, falmuriyati qadha, ha, yani, something. Let me get back to you on that. Anyone have Google? Nobody knows. For him to know, he has to look in the tafsir. Our children, all of us, we send them to Quran class. And as soon as they're one of the first surah, one of the first sections they'll learn is Juz Amma. You ask them, what does it mean? I have Allah, I don't know. Some of us here, maybe we've memorized Surah Wal Adiyat 40 years or more. What does it mean? I don't know. Why? Because there is no faham. There is ilm. You know it, but there's no faham, there's no understanding. This is what Imam al-Nawawi is going to clarify for us now, the importance of making that distinction between knowledge and understanding that knowledge and using it in our life. What you will also find, my dear brothers and sisters, is that Allah makes a very clear example of this in the Qur'an. And He uses two of His prophets of Allah, Dawood alayhi salam and his son, Sulaiman. Allah says in the Quran, Kullan atayna ilma. Both of them, we gave knowledge. But when it came to judgment, to understanding the application, to giving verdicts, Allah says, Wafahamnaha Sulaiman. We allowed Sulaiman to understand it, even though Dawood did not. Dawood is a prophet of Allah, he is a messenger of Allah. He was given knowledge that Allah says we gave him knowledge. But yet when it came to this particular level of understanding, his son, younger than him, understood more than him. What was the issue? The hadith is narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari. A man came to the Prophet Dawood and he said, you are our ruler, you are the king, you are the Prophet of Allah. Uhkum baynana. Give judgment. This man... His sheep, they broke through and ate all of my vineyard. I have no, I cannot make any money this year. All my vineyard, all my fruits have been eaten and destroyed. Prophet Dawood said, okay, my judgment is your sheep of equal value to what you would have received become his property. Khalas, the one who lost, you give him your sheep. Prophet Sulaiman said, no, you're wrong, father. Uh-oh. This is the king, this is the Prophet of Allah. How is it wrong? Prophet Sulaiman said, because his vines will grow grapes next year, and the trees will fruit apples next year. So if you give him the sheep, and his fruit comes back next year, he's been given what he is owed, and more than what he's owed. It is fairer, it is more just, if he keeps the sheep, and whatever they produce and whatever he sells from them, he can keep its profit and returns the initial capital back to that man when his vines and his fruits grow. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, both of them had knowledge, but Sulaiman had fahm, understanding. We will continue with that insha'Allah after Salat al-Dhuh. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruk wa atubu ilayk.